Welcome to the second episode of Diamond Bar High School's Astronomy Club's podcast. I'm your host, Bonnie Nian, and today we'll be diving into special planets outside of the typical ones you may have heard about. Joining me are Wendy Shi and Daniel Shao, and we're going to be covering all you need to know about dwarf planets and exoplanets. Thanks, Bonnie. It's really interesting to learn about dwarf planets because not only are they rare and exhibit different behaviors than anything else, they help us better understand our solar system and its history. For example, studying Pluto's orbit led to the recognition of the giant planet's orbital migration. Placing trans-Neptunian dwarf planets, such as Haumea in context, also allowed us to understand the physics behind collisions of icy and rocky objects and how this affects their orbits. Yeah, that's really intriguing. I think it's especially interesting how astronomy is connected to so many fields of STEM. There's aspects of physics, chemistry, and math all intertwined. Before we get into any more, though, Daniel, can you explain what the criteria are for a dwarf planet? Yeah, so the main difference between dwarf planets and regular planets such as Earth and Mars are their sizes. Dwarf planets orbit the sun just like regular planets, but they are just much smaller than them. On the other hand, they are bigger than asteroids, which shows in the structure of dwarf planets. Asteroids have a more irregular shape that is not very smooth or round, while dwarf planets, due to just a bit more gravity and mass, can retain a spherical shape. Fascinating. I know some common ones are Pluto, Ceres, Maya, and Matumaki. Could you guys tell me, could you guys tell us more about these? Yeah, and there are others too. Like you mentioned, there's Pluto, which is the most famous dwarf planet. It was considered a ninth planet until its reclassification in 2006. It has a heart-shaped region on its surface known as Tombaugh Regio. There's also Ceres, the only dwarf planet in the inner solar system and the largest object in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. It's similar to terrestrial planets, but much less dense. Haumea is another example, named after the Hawaiian goddess of fertility, and one of the fastest rotating large objects in our solar system. Very little is known about its surface and atmosphere, but scientists do not think that Haumea has a magnetosphere. And to add even more to that, there's also an, a dwarf planet called Make Make, one of the brightest objects in the Kuiper Belt, and it's second only to Pluto. The unusual name originates from the Rapa Nui, god of fertility. It takes about 305 years for Make Make to orbit the sun just once, but one of its days is only 22.5 Earth hours. Make Make has a tiny dark moon that is often unseeable in the glare of the dwarf planet's brightness. The extremely cold surface downwards of negative 243 degrees Celsius means that it is almost impossible for life to thrive there. At perihelion, which is the period of time when a celestial object is closest to the sun, a very thin atmosphere of nitrogen may develop on Make Make's surface. Eris, another dwarf planet that resides in the Kuiper Belt, is named after the Greek goddess of discord and strife. It's cold and uninhabitable, just like Make Make. Eris itself is rocky and just a bit smaller than Earth's moon, although it also has a moon for itself, called Dysnomia. Eris is so far away from the sun that it takes 557 years for one full revolution, and the atmosphere freezes and collapses when it is farthest away from the sun. Eris and Make Make were the two major discoveries that prompted the International Astronomical Union to reconsider what constituted a planet. That's interesting. I didn't know there were so many dwarf planets. Now, from these tiny locals in our galaxy, let's move on to even farther distances, exoplanets. Tell me, Wendy, what exactly is an exoplanet? An exoplanet is a planet that exists outside of our solar system. They come in varying shapes and sizes, are made from similar elements to those found in our solar system, but have major variations in their environment. Most exoplanets orbit a star. Few exoplanets only orbit the center of the galaxy, called rogue stars, and some even orbit two stars simultaneously. And how do we find these exoplanets? There's a lot of different ways to find them, but some of the most major ones are the radial velocity method, the transit method, and microlensing. So first of all, radial velocity relies on the fact that massive celestial objects, such as stars, don't remain completely stationary when they are orbited by a relatively massive planet. The stars would move in small elliptical trajectories, and using knowledge of something called the Doppler effect, we can find exoplanets by first finding their host stars. The Doppler effect is present when light waves are compressed or stretched, which help us determine if the source of the light is moving towards or away from us. Another method of finding exoplanets, called the transit method, relies on the trajectory of a planet blocking the light of its host star a little bit. 
In order to ensure that it is really a planet that is causing the dimness, researchers look for multiple detections. The size of the planet can be determined through how dim the light received by us becomes. And finally, we have the microlensing method. This method is able to find exoplanets from a great length away by observing how much gravity bends light from distant stars. Large objects, such as planets, bend the light of their star. The more mass of the planet, the brighter the star will appear. There is also the astrometry method, which tracks irregular star positions produced by an orbiting exoplanet. Detecting the wobble of stars is difficult and requires precise observations. This method can also help determine an exoplanet's mass. Lastly, direct imaging detects exoplanets with light from the planets themselves, as it reflects from a planet's atmosphere at infrared wavelengths. This is a tricky technique, but because of how careful everything has to be completed, less mistakes are made. I see. So to recap, exoplanets are planets outside of our solar system, and we find through a variety of methods, including using radio velocity or the Doppler effect, the transit method, microlensing, astrometry, and direct imaging. These basically rely on observing elliptical trajectories, the bending of light or dimness due to exoplanets, bending of gravity due to exoplanets, tracting wobble of stars, and actually imaging the exoplanets themselves, respectively. Lynn, using these methods, what types of ex exoplanets have we discovered so far? Yeah, so there's really a really astonishing diversity. There's hot Jupiters, which are gas giants that orbit closer to their stars. They're extremely hot, and since they're so close to their host star, this causes them to puff out, making them very light. There's also terrestrial exo exoplanets, which are roughly Earth-sized and composed of rock, silicate, water, and carbon. In addition, there are, there are also something called Neptunian exoplanets. These are similar in size to Neptune and Uranus, but they're still a mystery because few are discovered close to their stars. Lastly, there are rogue planets, otherwise known as isolated planetary mass objects, or free-floating planets. Does this mean they aren't gravitationally bound to stars? Yeah. How is this possible? Well, the current possible explanation scientists have thought of is that they were formed in planetary systems and then flung away by gravitational interactions with other planets in the same system or by encounters with another star system. Of course, they could have been formed outside of planetary systems as well, but that's highly unlikely. Yeah, and we've actually found a lot of those. In fact, NASA has reported that we've now found more than 3,700 exoplanets. Wow, that's a lot. Could you give me some more specific examples, some known exoplanets? For sure. Discovered in 1994, PSR B1257 plus 12b was one of the first known exoplanets. This planet is most likely void of any life as it is orbiting a pulsar, which sends out massive waves of radiation. Its mass is 2% of Earth's and has an orbital period of 25.3 days. Another is Kepler 16b which orbits two stars. Discovered in 2011, this exoplanet has a mass one-third of Jupiter's and, despite the two suns, is likely very cold. On the other hand, there's one more too, TRES-2b. This planet is 1.5 times the mass of our Jupiter and is exactly what not to look for when we're searching for planets that are able to sustain life. It has an atmosphere that is as hot as lava and there's almost no visible light at all. Len, I guess this is where we look at the big question. Could any of these exoplanets host life? So that's really something scientists have been investigating for a very long time, and people are also definitely curious about it. It's very ambiguous, though. We generally look for planets that are in habitable zones, which are planets close enough to their stars so that temperatures would potentially allow liquid water to form on the planet's surface. In order to observe this, light will be key. In transit spectroscopy, starlit passes through an atmosphere, and some is absorbed, and some is transmitted through it. When the light reaches it, it will have been refracted into different colors, like through a prism. Different colors that reach us tell us there are different chemicals present in the atmosphere that we are observing. Thanks for the explanation. And what exactly does studying all this contribute to astronomy? What can these discoveries tell us? Any other closing remarks? Well, it's the primary way for scientists to find signs of alien life the ultimate goal when studying exoplanets. This is important because we could find more technologically advanced aliens than us, unboxing a whole other world of problems and questions. 
Some other reasons of studying exoplanets provided by NASA researchers and engineers include to simply enjoy the feeling of discovering new things that no one has ever seen before, being able to study the origin of the formations of exoplanets, and that exoplanet exploration bridges the heavens into human consciousness. And that concludes our discussion on dwarf planets and exoplanets. We hope you guys enjoyed learning about these planets as much as we did, and we highly encourage you guys check out the links in the description to do some more research on your own.